When they go low, we get baseball bats. From any evening news. Here now the news. It was not merely in the history of stock car racing, but also perhaps in the history of sports, a unique and ultimate, ultimately terrifying day. The other comparisons, the heart attack that claimed hockey's Howie Morenz in 1937, the plane crash that killed most of England's Manchester United football team in 1958, the murder of California Angels outfielder Lyman Bostock late in the season of 1978. Each overlapped in part what happened at Rockingham, North Carolina today, but none duplicated it. No sport had ever lost its greatest star during a competition and then went on its schedule uninterrupted the next game, the next day, or the next week. But NASCAR did. The drivers and the fans went back to the starting line, and one man was missing. Dale Earnhardt Jr. in the middle of the group there. In the moments before the race, it took on elements of the moments after the Oklahoma State crash or the other tragedies we have seen in sports. I wish the Democrats would play that game to 10% of the levels that the Republicans do until the Democrats stop rolling over for this and saying, well, we're not going to dirty our hands. Right, when they right. go high, we go low. So when they go low, we get baseball bats. That should be the next you know, big, let's get Obama out there saying, when they go low, we get baseball bats. I think that would solve this completely. I don't know how devoted his uh, following is, uh, but I'm hoping that no one actually goes out and grabs baseball bats. Maxine Waters will be proud. Um, go after them wherever they go in their stores, wherever they follow, follow them. And guess what? That was happening with Sarah Huckabee Sanders and all the other, uh, you know, all the other players during the Trump era, wherever they want. So what is going to be happening now is people are going to come out of the woodwork and feel as though they got to go and try to marginalize. Uh, try to marginalize the Republican majority in the House. They're going to be big players once they pick Kevin McCarthy as speaker, and I hope indeed they do. But, uh, Molly, I just got to warn you about uh, pretending that Keith Oberman's relevant. The only thing consistent with Keith Oberman is the word former, because everywhere he gets hired, he gets fired. So he's former ESPN, former MSNBC, and he leaves angry, and he sits in his apartment, and he tweets things that are totally inappropriate. So I just warn you against making Keith Oberman relevant. But I do think that if the, the five people that follow him, that if they're going to grab bats, he should be personally responsible. And also here we have institutionalized the terrorizing of the opposition. True domestic terror. Critics of your administration in the media, sir, receive letters filled with fake anthrax. Braying newspapers, sir, applaud or laugh and reveal details the FBI asked to have kept quiet and thus impede or ruin the investigation. A series of reactionary columnists, sir, encourages treason charges against a newspaper that published supposed national security information that was openly available on the Internet. One radio critic receives a letter threatening the revelation of as much personal information about her as can be obtained and expressing the hope that someone will then shoot her with an AK-47 machine gun. That number two story tonight's worst persons in the world. The bronze to Liz Cheney in an argument over the closing of Gitmo with Solange Joan Walsh, who is different than Liz in that she tells the truth. Joan reminds Liz that in June 2006, President Bush, quoting Joan, gave a speech where he said he would close it, Gitmo, and he would bring people home and try them here. Ms. Cheney dismissed Ms. Walsh. No, I'm sorry, he did not say he would bring terrorists onto the homeland. Joan, no, he didn't say that. President Bush, news conference at the U.S.-European Union summit, June 2006, called for the closing of Gitmo and said he'd send some of the detainees back to their home countries, but added, and we're quoting Liz Cheney's dad's boss, or assistant, there are some who need to be tried in U.S. courts. They're cold-blooded killers. They will murder somebody if they're let out on the street. And yet, we believe there's, there ought to be a way forward in a court of law. U.S. courts in the U.S. Liz Cheney wrong. The apple, as they say, did not fall far from the tree. And when it fell, it discharged, striking Harry Whittington. The runner-up, Coltergeist, had an echo chamber moment with a lunatic fringe radio host over David Letterman's jokes about Sarah Palin's daughters. The host said, but when you go after kids the way he did here, this is a young girl we're talking about. When you go after a woman this way, and Coltergeist actually said, well, and it's not just, just right, right. And if people didn't go after Chelsea Clinton, and they have not gone after Sasha and Malia. And, and, Annie, and...
John McCain at a 1998 dinner reportedly told a joke about Chelsea Clinton, which ended with, because her father is Janet Reno. He never denied that he told that joke. Rush Limbaugh, six years earlier, when Chelsea Clinton was younger na then than the younger Palin daughter is now. So long ago, Limbaugh still had a TV show. He put up a picture of socks the Clinton's cat and he asked did you know there's a White House dog and then he put up a picture of Chelsea Clinton and to use the vulgarities of the gutter you are a worthless coulter but our winner Reverend Jeremiah Wright speaking to a reporter from the Daily Press newspaper of Newport News Tuesday night after a sermon at the 95th annual Hampton University Ministers Conference asked if he had talked to the president he said no now the newspaper claims he began his answer with the phrase them Jews ain't gonna let me talk to or let him talk to me quotes him as such in the newspaper uh, that is during some crosstalk with the reporter I think it's right but later whatever he actually said there the context becomes appallingly clear have you spoken with him since he's been in the I White House? you ain't gonna let him talk to me I told my baby girl I said he'll talk to me five years from now when he's lame up or eight years when he's out of office he's a politician I'm a pastor he gotta do what politicians do from the Jewish vote the AIPAC vote that's controlling him, that will not let him send a representation to the Darfur Review Conference. It's talking this craziness in Israel because they're Zionists. They will not let him talk to somebody who calls the spade what it is. Ethnic cleansing that's going on in Gaza, the ethnic cleansing of the Zionists is a sin and a crime against humanity. Reverend Wright now says he misspoke, quote, I'm not talking about all Jews, all people of the Jewish faith, I'm talking about Zionists, unquote. Mr. Wright, turn in your collar, give your Bible to somebody who's read it, clean out your desk. If it were not true earlier, it is now. You are no longer, by the stretch of anybody's imagination, a man of God. Jeremiah Wright, today's worst person in the world. After nearly eight years as host of MSNBC's Countdown with Keith Oberman. This is the last edition of Countdown. The veteran broadcaster said goodbye to his viewers last night. For many occasions, particularly in the last two and a half years, were all that surrounded the show, but never the show itself. It was just too much for me. Oberman never said why he was leaving. During his tumultuous tenure, his liberal views became the driving force behind MSNBC's primetime shift to the political left. But as the years passed, relations with his bosses became increasingly strained. Keith Oberman has been battling with MSNBC management for two and a half years at least. In November, Oberman was suspended for two days for making donations to three Democratic candidates, a violation of company ethics policies. In a statement last night, MSNBC said the company and Oberman had, quote, ended their contract, adding MSNBC thanks Keith for his integral role in MSNBC's success. That whole primetime lineup kind of built on the quote-unquote brand that uh, uh, Oberman represented for them. Oberman's departure comes just days after cable giant Comcast received government approval to acquire MSNBC's parent company, NBC Universal. And MSNBC spokesman denied the merger had anything to do with the decision. Comcast, which is expected to close the deal next week, said in a statement it has no operational control at any of NBC's properties, including MSNBC. Late Friday, MSNBC host Rachel Maddow, Olbermann's liberal protege, said she knew little about what happened. All I know is that it was between Keith and the company. Observers say Maddow is now the heir apparent. In a way, she's the next generation of MSNBC. She's still in her 30s, and she's able to carry the ball forward. Keith Olbermann is looking for a new job. Less than a year after his talk show on Current TV launched, Olbermann isn't happy about the news. NBC's Gabe Gutierrez is here with the latest on this real-life TV drama. Gabe, good morning. Lester, perhaps even more surprising is who's already replaced him. Former New York Governor Elliot Spitzer, a man who was also no stranger to cable and controversy. Which of these stories will you be talking about tomorrow? Less than a year after moving to current TV, Keith Olbermann is currently out of a job. Some people say he's a genius, but others say he's a mad genius. As I was saying... Oberman was reportedly was making $10 million a year at the Upstart Cable Network, co-founded by Al Gore. But in an online statement Friday, that all changed. Current was founded on the values of respect, openness, collegiality, and loyalty to our viewers, the network said. Unfortunately, these values are no longer reflected in our relationship with Keith Oberman.
Oberman fired back on Twitter. It goes almost without saying that the claims against me implied in current statement are untrue and will be proved so in the legal actions I will be filing against them. All right, let's start with the with the. Keith law. Oberman has very high standards. So when he looks around and sees a studio plagued by technical difficulties, uh, he's liable not to show up for work. I'm Keith Oberman. Up Oberman's rise began in the early 90s at ESPN, where he drew attention for his feisty personality on SportsCenter. Their fate may have been sealed the day they changed uniforms. In a tell-all book last year, some co-workers described Oberman as the guy who made ESPN a household word. But others weren't as flattering. I was enraged by Oberman, ESPN's former chairman was quoted as saying. There was no choice but to get rid of him. <laughs> Today's worst person in the world. After switching to politics and scoring a big success for MSNBC with Countdown, Oberman clashed with his bosses and abruptly parted ways with the network. This is the last edition of Countdown. Before turning up on Current. Uh, I'm honored to be your first guest on your first show. Keith Oberman has made television much more point of view centric, much more personality centric. I'll be doing this till I'm 125 years old. A personality now off the air once again. Good evening, I'm Elliot Spitzer. Welcome to And replaced by another controversial figure, former New York Governor Elliot Spitzer, who resigned in disgrace after he admitted hiring a prostitute and two years later briefly hosted a show on CNN. Good night and good luck. Proving that in the world of television, there's often room for a comeback. Spitzer didn't mention his predecessor at all during last night's show. It is not clear where Olbermann might end up, but it appears this legal battle won't be over soon. Lester? All right, Gabe, thanks. Booster shot. Mission accomplished. And it is. It is time to stop coddling them, the ones who won't get the damn shot already. And our first step, you and I, is symbols the language we use. We call these people vaccine hesitant, vaccine skeptics, anti-vax. We say they're protesting mandates and passports. They're making a personal choice. They're waiting for more information. They're making a medical decision. Bullshit. They're afraid. They're afraid to get vaccinated. Stop feeding their egos about what they're doing. Stop legitimizing it. Vaccine hesitant, they're afraid. Vaccine skeptics, they're afraid. Anti-vax, they're afraid. They're protesting mandates in passports. They're afraid. They're making a personal choice, they're afraid. They're waiting for more information, afraid. They're making a medical decision to be afraid. The snowflakes are afraid. Afraid of the vaccine. Afraid of being proved wrong. Afraid of doing what anybody else in the world tells them to do. Afraid of needles. So no more pleasant euphemisms about what's going on here, apart from the people who have legitimate medical complications about vaccines. We have to stop coddling the morons who will not get the shot. We start by calling them what they are. They are all snowflakes and cowards and idiots and losers and most importantly they are afraid just have fun with it because i'm like dude you like get a life yeah. he stands on the balcony with overlooking central park and then he talked about all the does women he that money? he dates and does he have money I, I would hope so after all those contracts at all those places keith oberman is upset guys it's very important oh, that you man. guys all take a moment and appreciate his okay? frustration he calls for elon musk deportation during unhinged rant get the f out of our country go ahead keith Time to cancel all the contracts and reassess his immigration status and hopefully deport him the hell out of the country. And if we can't do that by conventional means, President Biden, you have presidential immunity. Get Elon Musk the F out of our country and do it now. What, a, what an emotional reaction. Places has he been fired from? 
All of them. No, no. How many places, Tom? Honestly. No, I think he's been M- fired. He had, feuds, he, was, he had feuds with his colleagues. So MSNBC's exit in 2011 was due to conflicts with management. He had a history of tense relationships with networks and coworkers. ESPN exit. Uh, he um, he worked at ESPN multiple times and has been fired. Twice. Or at least twice. He's just an angry, just... Like and, and mind you, but besides just him and his personality and what he's going through, like I hope he gets help. Five, I angry. think. Angry. So this is his. Is? This is his daily exercise. This is his cardio. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it's unfortunate and it's not healthy, man. You're- Trump is still a Hitler. He was shot at by a MAGA, and the Republican bid for unity after the assassination attempt. It's just another Trump con. This is the America Trump wanted. This is the America he gets. He was shot at by a gun-obsessed MAGA kid with Trump signs in the front yard of his home in a MAGA world where stochastic terror is Trump's only religion. Republicans, stop shooting at Donald Trump. Shame on Biden and the other Democrats and the eternally gullible media for falling for the promises of a Trump pivot as part of the unity that Trump expects. He wants all criminal charges to be dropped against him immediately. Different day same con plus the dismissal of the documents case by trump's concierge judge on the exact morning that the gop convention starts what would trump do in a mirror situation where he were president well the other candidate gets shot at trump would invoke the insurrection act and arrest everybody president biden do it do it right now Also, please stop with the violence has never had a role in American politics. Our politics is a river of blood. 45 presidents, 20 of them have either been killed, wounded, or had a gun plot against them. What's the effect on this candidate in this race after this assassination attempt? All the previous ones who were shot at, lost. And so many people said so many dumb things that the worst persons list has 18 persons on it. Spoiler alert, the winner is Trump's new VP candidate, J.D. Vance, who once compared him to Hitler. All that and more on the Tuesday Countdown podcast, now live wherever you podcast. Keith Olbermann. (laughs) Our good friend Keith Olbermann who I believe just does a podcast now. Is that right, Buck? That's his uh, sole employment, so far as we know. He's not on television, right? Raising many cats, I believe. Raising many cats, Keith Olbermann, in his Central Park apartment. Um, Kind of perfect example of what happens if you go too far left wing. Eventually, you just lose your mind, and you end up shrieking out on your balcony about how many shots you need to get for COVID or else you'll die. I guess he made the mistake. He hasn't. Has he come after you in a while, Buck? Um, Not in a little while, no. I don't I and, and by the way Twitter's sometimes hard to follow now so I don't necessarily see crazy Keith Olbermann dropping into my mentions like I have before so maybe he's still occasionally firing off at me Did you get a Bach cool or, nickname cuz he gave me a cool nickname do you get a nickname or not I, I don't think I have a nickname I think I'm just basically all that's evil in the world according to uh, Olbermann uh but I guess he came after Megan Kelly and that was not Oof. a really smart Mm-mm. decision I don't Mm-mm. think Megan Kelly, very smart, fearless, having a lot of success with uh, with her show, and we cl- we grabbed this clip because I heard you playing it and I was laughing. Uh, here is Megan Kelly going after Keith Olbermann. This is what a dead body looks like. Listen, even uh, Keith Olbermann was saying similar things, uh, comparing Tucker to a Nazi. He also, for good measure, decided to tweet about me because I said Tucker is going to be better off without Fox and said something to the effect of, you got fired from Fox and NBC. What would you know about it? So first of all, you misstate the circumstances of my departure from NBC, sir. That's all I'm allowed to say about it. Uh, And as for Fox, there were widely reported facts that I was offered $100 million to stay there. uh, But the record's very clear that I left voluntarily because I wanted to raise my family, something you don't know anything about because no one would marry you and you have no children. You have a cold, lonely life in which you become a bitter, bitter man, something I wouldn't know anything about because my life is joyful and I've managed to raise my own children. And someday I hope you have that pleasure, but I don't have high hopes it's going to happen. I mean, that was a Chuck Norris roundhouse kick to the face. Wow. Oh, my goodness. And I I admit that I come to this with with a a degree of bias, and I always uh, will, will put that 
out in front, but I really do believe it, so I, I say it. Uh, you look at the people on the right who... Keith Olbermann was at one point the biggest name at MSNBC by yes. far. The most famous Democrat commentator in the country. He is a lunatic, my friends, and not a very happy or nice man, obviously. And Megan decided that she did not take kindly to him trying to trash her career, especially given she's been very, very successful. So it's just it was a bizarre thing for him to do, but it shows a nastiness. The people on the right who are, um, you know, look, no one's perfect and we all have our challenges, but the people on the right whose names you all know are overwhelmingly um, good people that you'd want to hang out with. I, I just, I'm sorry, it's just true. And there are a lot of people on the left who are, uh, I'm t- again, I'm talking about pundits here in the pundit class and, you know, whether we're talking CNN, MSNBC, etc., cetera, uh, who are deeply unhappy, miserable and nasty people. And now it's it's not a perfect system, but I think that people people that uh, on the right in media are generally a happier, nicer bunch. I'm just saying. Let's go to Blue MAGA. Um, the ambassador of Blue MAGA, the top ambassador, is a man by the name of Keith Olbermann, who, believe it or not, at one time uh, was a renowned cable news host and now likes to embarrass himself on a regular basis on Twitter. So he posted, following the Supreme Court's unanimous decision, the Supreme Court has betrayed democracy. Its members, including Jackson, meaning Katanji Brown Jackson, Kagan and Sotomayor have proved themselves inept at reading comprehension. And collectively, the court has shown itself to be corrupt and illegitimate. It must be dissolved. So there you have Keith Olbermann arguing that a major part of our system of checks and balances should absolutely be dissolved because they had a unanimous decision that he didn't like. <laughs> Insanity. Yeah. So for Oberman to do sophistry and be like, oh, they can't read, they should be dissolved. That's childish, okay, so that's number one. Number two, his main case is we gotta, you gotta vote against Trump because the democracy's on the line. And now he's saying let's dissolve one of the branches of our government. <laughs> it's a totally indefensible, just moronic. And when you're attacking the liberal justices, look, if there was a money in politics case or other cases where they said something egregious, okay, and I have that conversation. But in this case, they were unanimous for a reason, because no one adjudicated Trump to be an insurrectionist other than random Democrats in two or three states. That's not how the process works, that's not how the process should work. But guys like Oberman, who are, have, are blue MAGA, have lost their minds, that's why you call them blue MAGA. Right, Red MAGA thinks Trump won the 2020 election, et cetera, so they lost their minds in that way. It, re, it detached from objective reality. And Blue MAGA is just as detached. The other thing that Oberman is always crying about is, don't believe numbers, numbers are lies, only believe my emotions, right? And that is not a rational way to think. And he's become a buffoon, really. Right, and the numbers- Saying that, oh yeah, no, no polling matters. There's no such thing as science when it comes to polling. The data sucks, numbers are for losers. Oh, emotions, right? Totally. I- that MSNBC was mainly doing propaganda for Democrats and now he's just mask off on it. On the Friday edition of the Countdown Podcast, if you have thought that I or others have been alarmist or hyperbolic in comparing Donald Trump to Adolf Hitler, to insisting that he is in reality an anti-Semite, he has now erased all doubt. At a dinner fighting anti-Semitism at the Israeli-American Council, Trump said last night, quote, if I don't win this election and the Jewish people would really have a lot to do with that if that happens, because at 40%, meaning 40% support from them, that means, he said, 60% of the people are voting for the enemy. The Jewish people would have a lot to do with the loss, Trump said. He added, you're putting yourself in danger. There is no more stark comparison and there is no more stark evidence. That is the talk of Hitler pre-power in Germany in the late 20s and early 30s. It is in short, quote, the Jews are to blame, unquote. Now that makes the Mark Robinson story seem almost uplifting. The question becomes with his own declaration that he is a quote, black Nazi, a declaration made on a porn site a decade or more ago. How did he not become Trump's running mate? All that and more on the Friday Countdown podcast now live wherever you podcast.
But I'd like you to listen instead to the Elon Musk segment because the tipping point is here. Musk is now interfering with American foreign policy. He is now aiding the enemies of this nation. And he's now following the instruction of Russian propagandists. The tipping point is Elon Musk has become a danger to the United States of America. The decision to not fact check the fire hose of lies that is Donald Trump, that is the entirety of his existence and the entirety of his campaign, the decision to not fact check any one of those lies by CNN was one of the most immoral decisions in the history of the free press in this country. Literally, I am suggesting that at some point tonight, CNN should, it will not, go off the air in shame, fire everybody, seal off the buildings, make sure everybody's out, and burn the goddamn place to the ground. Let's say Trump wins uh -huh. um, three weeks from today. Mm -hmm. What happens? The Democratic Party is, I mean, as you said, um, a lot of Democrats, maybe the majority, believe that Trump becoming president again is the worst thing yeah. that ever could happen. So how do they I, respond to that? I say this not flippantly. I think it will be the cause of the greatest mental health crisis in the history of the country. I don't, I think tens of millions of people will question their connection to the, the nation, their connection to other human beings, their connection to uh, their vision of what their future for them and their children could be like. And I think that will be uh, require an enormous amount of access to mental health professionals. I think it'll lead to uh, a, a trauma in the workplace. I think there'll be some degree of- Are you being protest, serious? 100% uh, serious, 100% serious. I think there'll be alcoholism, there'll be broken marriages. There'll what? Be, yeah. They, they, they think he's the worst person possible to be president and having one by the hand of Jim Comey and Fluke in 2016 and then performed in office for four years, I think it will cause the biggest mental health crisis in the history of America. And I don't think it will be kind of a passing thing that by the inauguration will be fine. I think it will be sustained and, and unprecedented and hideous. And I don't think the country's ready for it. I think it will be more, it'll be less anger and more um, a, a failure to understand uh, how it could happen. You know, like, like, like the death of a child or your spouse announcing that, 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 you know, your wife announcing she's a lesbian and she's leaving you for your best friend, like a, like a, like a, a something that's, that's so traumatic that it is impossible for even the most mentally healthy person to truly, uh, process and incorporate into their daily life. I hope I'm wrong, but, but I think <laughs> well, that, I think that's well, what's going to happen for tens of millions of people because they, they think that, 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 that their fellow citizens supporting Trump is a sign of fundamental evil at the heart of their fellow citizens and of the nation. That's how they view it. Well, that's very heavy. Yeah. Uh -huh. When they go low, we get baseball bats. Wow.